Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out. Oh, in case you're wondering where I am, look over here. I'm always putting you inside this computer screen, but today I'm going inside my computer to look on my hard drive for the best material from the show. Good idea, right? You've asked me a lot of cool questions, like these. What I want to know is how big is the biggest bird alive? Do dinosaurs eat people? Why do whales howl at the moon? Does the flying fish really fly? How do fish drink? Is it better to be To find out the answers, I met a lot of interesting people. But you know who I also met a lot of? Animals. Animals of every kind. They helped us find stuff out too. Why are people scared of big animals and not small ones? The short answer is teeth. It's better to be the eater than the eaten, right? Cause I'm big, my life is sweet. All the creatures I eat are meat. But so small, their life is brief. You'll get stuck right in my teeth. See, cause I'm big and I'm mighty. Like a T-Rex, I'm pretty bitey. So step back when I'm on attack. Whack! You're gonna be my snack. <laughs> Even some big animals that don't bite, like elephants, might crush you by accident. But you know what? Some people are scared of small animals too, with good reason. Scorpions and tarantulas are small, but they have nasty, venomous stings. Some kinds of frogs are poisonous if you eat them. And some snakes, like this sea snake, can kill you with one bite. Poison and venom are small animals' way of saying, don't even think about eating meat. It's lucky big animals don't do that. Can you imagine a poisonous giraffe or a venomous cow? Scary, I wouldn't want to milk one of those. Why do wolves howl at the moon? Let's take a look at some wolves howling. Wolves howl a lot. They even howl in the daytime. I checked and wolves are more active on nights when the moon is bright, since just like with us, it helps them see. And the more active they are, the more they howl. So it's not that they are howling at the moon. It's just that when the moon is bright, they're most likely to be going out doing all the things that wolves like to do. Like howling. Ah! Wolves hold their head up high when they howl, which is why if they're howling when the moon is out, it looks like they're howling at the moon. But speaking of wolves and full moons. Does the moon turn peoples into werewolves? <laughs> The Flat Earth Corner! Does the moon turn people into werewolves? Well, as everyone in medieval Europe knows, duh, of course it does. I'm actually getting as hungry as a wolf. I really could use some moon cheese. Strange, that one didn't sound like my stomach. Werewolf, again! <laughs> People used to believe that the full moon turned people into werewolves. But the truth is, there's no such thing as werewolves, except in movies. But that doesn't mean you have to tell your little brother or sister. Moon. When you had questions about color, animals helped answer those too. Will he change color? Well, a lot of people believe that uh, chameleons change color for camouflage, which isn't actually true. Their primary reason for changing color is a form of communication. Uh, chameleons, like Camellio, don't have external ear opening, so chameleons are deaf, they can't hear the way we can, and they use their color to communicate with other chameleons. When will the chameleon change colors? Well, they change color depending on you know their mood and if they see another chameleon. In this case, chameleon changes if he sees a male chameleon to let him know, hey, I'm another male and I don't want you to be over here. So that male sees him, recognizes those colors as him being aggressive. Or if he sees a female and he gets excited, he has a different set of colors that he changes to let the female know that he's excited. And if she likes him, she changes certain colors to let him know that she thinks he's kind of cute too. Cool. If we put a mirror in front of him, do you think he'll change color because he thinks it's another male? Camilio, look over here. I don't think he sees oh. it. Oh, he sees it now. So Harrison, what we're seeing right now is he's getting a little bit nervous right now. If we all stay really still, 
Oh, and he's, he's trying to make himself look bigger right now, and he's definitely changing his shade a little bit. Okay. So he hasn't completely bought into there being another chameleon here, but you can see that his colors are getting a little bit more distinct, and this is happening from him increasing his blood flow to certain areas. Um, yeah, you got some brown skin. and white there. Exactly. Like along the dark green spots. Your questions about animals and sleep also gave me some of my favorite moments. Why do Max sleep upside down? The big answer is... to make a quick getaway! Say, poor Mr. Bat is asleep when a hungry raccoon spots him. A bird could just quickly fly up and away. But poor old Mr. Bat can't take off fast like a bird. His wings aren't strong enough. He can only start to fly by dropping into the air. So what's a bat gonna do? Suddenly, that old raccoon lunges at Mr. Bat. Mr. Bat lets go and drops through the air. He gets up enough speed to start flying and make his getaway. Whoa, that story had me hanging on the edge of my seat. When you hang on to something, you have to think about tightening your hands around it. But for a bat, it's the opposite. Their claws naturally close. They have to consciously make them open. That keeps them from falling when they're asleep. So they have to wake up and let go and start flying. And that is why they sleep upside down. And just for the record, this position is very uncomfortable. Ugh. And I found out when bats aren't sleeping, they're eating. <coughs> bats eat insects, fruit, mice, <coughs> fish, <coughs> and even other bats. <coughs> Why do dogs go off? -off? Some scientists in Hungary have figured out that when dogs bark, they're telling us how they feel. And there are different barks for different feelings, like this is the play bark. That's the bark a dog makes when he's playing fun doggy games, like tug of war or wrestling. Okay, now this is the stranger bark. That's the bark a dog makes when there's a stranger at the door. And here's another kind of dog doing the stranger bark. There are so many different breeds of dogs, but they all have the same way of communicating with us. Now, if you knew what the play bark and the stranger bark meant before I told you, you're not alone. People and dogs have a special relationship, and scientists have discovered that people can tell the difference between dog barks, even people without dogs. How? Adaptation. Dogs have been our companions for thousands of years. And scientists think their different barks changed over time to sound a lot alike, at least in tone, so that they can communicate with us. These dogs might look different, but they seem to be saying the same thing. Dogs aren't the only animals that communicate with sound. When do whales go? Are they really communicating, or are they just going? Well, Wolfie, I went to my favorite neighborhood aquarium. Hey, Harrison. Hi. So to find out the answer from my favorite aquarium person, Nicole Can. And she says that whales not only communicate with each other using sound, but some of them, like belugas, use the same trick as submarines. They actually use sound to figure out where to go. It's incredible. It's like they can see using sound. Well, these belugas eat a lot of a fish called herring. And herring is a fish that has a very interesting way of communicating. Mm -hmm. They make distinct pulse-like sounds in their guts that are way too low for us to hear. Uh, by their guts, you mean? Yeah, I mean farting. Ah, gross. Well, I just communicated myself. Oh, gross, Harrison. You had questions about birds, too. What I want to know is how big is the biggest bird alive? The bird with the biggest wingspan and the world's champion long-distance flyer is the wandering albatross. 
So, how wide is the wingspan of an albatross? This wide! <laughs> These kids think it's a really heavy bird. If I were a bird, I would like to be an albatross because I have a big appetite. So I want to know how much you think an albatross weighs. 1,000 pounds. 55 pounds. 805 pounds. 300 pounds. 115 pounds. 500 pounds. 99 pounds. 20. And the winner's you! Yes! An albatross weighs just over 20 pounds, which is about the weight of a one-year-old baby. Wow. I find it unbelievable. I thought it was 500 pounds. Whoa! <laughs> so how much do you think I weigh? 80, uh, 90, 102, 102. Actually, I weigh 70 pounds. I guarantee it. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you can put me down there if you want. It's not heavy. So I weigh about 70 pounds, which would be three and a half albatrosses. My wings would have to be this wide for me to be able to fly. That would be hard. I'd need a lot of wide open space to land, and it would be really, really difficult to go inside anywhere. Does the flying fish really fly? Almost. Flying fish can fly by swimming really fast and then leaping into the air and spreading their fins like wings. That lets them get away from other fish that want to eat them. They can glide almost the length of a hockey rink. Some scientists believe that flying fish are evolving into true flyers. Did you know bees and flies flap 200 times per second? And other insects flap up to 1,000 times per second. You'd have to flap at least this fast to get off the ground. Do it, bees do it, even squirrels or fish do it, flying through the air, so why can't I? Bats do it, snakes do it, even some squids do it, flying through the air, so why can't I? No hollow bones or feathery wings, no stretchy skin, but I have these. Didn't evolve with these adaptions, we can't fly without contraptions. Without them, more herky-jerky, might as well be a frozen turkey. out why some animals are small when I tried to get a horse to ride at my birthday party. That definitely was a memorable experience. Harrison, did you order a horse? Yes, Mom, it's for my party. I used one of my animal gift certificates to rent a horse. I'm having a rodeo theme. Yeehaw. You didn't send the horse upstairs, did you? Howdy, ma'am. Is my horse back in the yard? No, he's right there behind you. Where? <laughs> Turns out his name is Rocky. <laughs> it's like a dog. <laughs> and this is his owner, Shanna Hadlock. She breeds horses. <laughs> and that's Rocky's mom, Skye. So like my turtle, Fluffy, he's small, but he's gonna get really big. Is it the same with these horses? I uh, know she's done growing and he'll grow a bit more, but he probably won't be as tall as his mom. I promised all my friends there'd be horseback riding. How am I supposed to ride this? Well, these horses weren't really bred to be ridden. Originally, they were bred to be used in the coal mines. So they used them to go down the coal mines because they were small? Yep, they would pull the coal out. So are they small because of the way they're bred? Yep, like we choose the parents, mm -hmm. and when you t take two small parents, you get small babies. Yeah. Like, his mother is 30 and 3 quarter inches tall, but his father is only 29 and 3 quarter wow. inches tall. And he'll probably be in between the two. If you kept breeding them, would they get smaller and smaller, or would they stay about the same? Um, if you kept breeding small horses to another small horse, mm -hmm. and then bred their offspring to smaller horses, mm -hmm. they eventually they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So maybe in a long time from now we'll have... Little miniature horses. <laughs> yeah, well, they actually have what is called a dwarf miniature horse. The smallest horse in the world is a dwarf, and her name's Thumbelina. And how big is she? She's 19 and a half inches tall, if I remember right. It's cute, but not very practical for horseback riding. I guess the take-home message would be, next time you say, Daddy, I want a pony, make sure to specify size. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if you could breed dinosaurs like the size of little hamsters? You could play with them and put them in your pocket and take them to school. 
I would never eat Harrison. I'm big and scary and not that big and scary, but I'm pretty big and scary. But I wouldn't eat Harrison because I'm a nice guy, right? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Or would I? <laughs> oh, sorry. Why is the biggest animal that ever lived on Earth? I'm Harris Tottle, an ancient Greek scientist, and I discovered that the biggest animal ever were giants, human giants. Look at this giant bone I found. It's its leg bone. B five full bum. That hypothesis was dumb. When ancient people found huge bones of extinct animals, they thought they must be giants, like Jack and the Beanstalk. So even though the bones look similar to human bones, there were never any giant people. But what is the biggest animal that ever lived? Do you think it's a bear? Or maybe an elephant? What about a rhinoceros? I looked it up, and the biggest land animal ever was probably the Argentinosaurus. Notice how everything comes back to dinosaurs? The Argentinosaurus was so big, it was about as big as three school buses. But guess what? That's not the biggest animal that has ever lived. Check this out. Fortunately, the biggest animal that ever lived is still alive, and it's gentle. It's the blue whale. Blue whales can get to be up to 100 feet long, or 33 meters. That's the same size as an NBA basketball court. I heard that they could fit an elephant on their tongue. <gasps> Would you go off my tongue, please? And some of my favorite moments were when I asked you some questions about animals. Whenever I'm at the sea aquarium, there's always one question I want to find out. So, do you guys think that sea monsters are real? No. No. Yes. Uh, not really. So, uh, do you think sea monsters are real? No. <laughs> what about your bathtub? There's sea monsters in there, right? No. <laughs> if they do, did exist, what do you think they would look like? Well, it could be green or maybe gray from the water it's been in mm -hmm. and the pollution. A big blob, yeah. A big blob? A dark color, like green or black, and have sharp teeth. Sharp teeth. That's pretty scary. So what do you think a sea monster would sound like? <laughs> nice. Personally, I think the sea monster would look something like this. Scary. I'm so scared. There's a monster in the sea. Away! Yo, there's a monster in the sea. You better not go. It's spreading oil on the waves. For 20,000 leagues. And garbage in the deep. Davy Jones, no. It's got billions of teeth. And billions of arms. It's eating all the fish. And, and it's causing lots of harm. harm. But it doesn't look like these creepy beasts. Cause, Cause the, the monster in the sea is you and me. Cause the monster in the sea is you and me. Yes, the monster in the sea is you and me. Do dinosaurs eat people? The big answer is no. Thank goodness. They're extinct, but their great-great-grandkids can bite. Animals are always changing to adapt to their environments, but who knows? Maybe a small animal today will be gigantic in a million years from now. So, the take-home message is be extra nice to parrots and other animals. Your questions about animals got me into some hairy situations. Why don't worms have fur? The short answer is because worms don't care how they look. Yeah, I really don't care. But seriously, only mammals have fur. I looked it up. Birds, reptiles, bugs, none of them have fur. And here's something cool. Our own hair is made with keratin, which is the same stuff as animal fur. So I'm guessing our hair and animal fur have something in common. And I even got to find out what it's like to have animal fur. We have as many hairs on our body as a gorilla, but ours are a lot finer than theirs. Good thing, or we'd look like this. That's my show, and that was some of my favorite stuff. 
See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out. Hi, I'm wearing this lab coat and carrying these test tubes because my school's having a science fair and my teacher asked us to do a project for it. Now, I was thinking I should have used something like these test tubes or weird math equations and stuff that makes your brain hurt. But then I thought about your questions on finding stuff out and I went like... Eureka! Science isn't some strange thing that happens in a lab. It's a part of our everyday lives. It's all around us. So, I used some of your questions and put together this special episode to prove it. Starting with the answer to this question from Anastasia. Why can't everything be solar powered? Solar is another word for sun, and the sun does power a lot of things. Almost everything on our planet. Oh, that's hot. I was able to cook an egg using nothing but the sun's energy. Well, it worked. And I drove an electric boat that was powered by nothing but the sun. I found out there's a connection between sun and plants. Plants use the energy from the sun's light to grow. And do we ever need plants? Plants make the oxygen that we breathe. They also help take pollution out of the air and turn it into useful things for us. Like this wood that my house is made of. It came from trees which got carbon, the hard stuff in the wood, out of carbon dioxide in the air. And science is used to turn plants into all sorts of things that are around us. Like this bamboo. Scientists have found a way to turn it into underwear. What? You don't believe me? Here, I'll show you. Actually, on second thought, maybe you should just take my word for it. Or you can watch my guest, Colette Simon, who told me about it. Well, you can turn bamboo into clothes. That wouldn't be very comfortable, would it? Well, actually, it's really soft, and you can make all kinds of things out of it, like underwear. <laughs> you can also make uh, cloth out of wood. They ground it up, and they make it into a pulp, and that's how you get rayon. So you'd be wearing a tree. You'd be <laughs> wearing a tree, but this is from rayon, and you can feel it's really comfortable also. Oh, wow. Of course, we eat plants, too. And speaking of food, there's a lot of science about the things we munch on. I found that out when I answered this question from Gwen. Why do girls have more taste buds than boys? La la la, la la la. Duh, girls have more taste buds than boys do, so I can enjoy this lovely lollipop more than a boy can. Mm. Who says girls have more taste buds? I think boys do. <laughs> Actually, they're both wrong. There was a recent study done in Denmark. That's the country where Vikings came from long ago. And it shows that there's no real difference in the number of taste buds that boys and girls have. But there is a difference in the way boys and girls taste. Boys and girls both taste good to me. Excuse me. I didn't mean as in eating boys and girls. I meant how boys and girls judge taste differently than each other. Oh. Hey, what's he doing here? Get your own show. Yeah. Now, where was I? Oh, right. Girls can taste both sweet and sour better than boys can. <laughs> so a lemon would taste more sour to a girl, but an ice cream cone would taste sweeter. Tasty! Need some sweetening. Much better. And I found out that our senses can trick us and make us feel hungry when we're not. Dogs salivate when they see food. <sighs> As an experiment, a scientist named Pavlov rang a bell every time he fed dogs in his research lab. <sighs> the dogs got so used to hearing a bell ring every time they got fed, that eventually, Pavlov could make the dogs drool just by ringing the bell, without giving them any food. I don't like to waste food, but sometimes I have no choice. Like with this banana peel, I can't eat it. But I found out that science can help with that too. This is where my family keeps some of our slimiest garbage, like last week's leftover salad. Imagine how I felt when my mom said she was making my snack with this stuff. 
Ugh. Let me show you what happened. Harrison! I made a snack for you! Harrison? Where are you? I have a really good snack for you, Harrison! Where'd that boy go? Harrison? Very good snack! Yummy, yummy! Harrison? Turns out the snack was just some berries from our garden. Oh. This is a special kind of garbage called compost, made from food scraps. When it rots, you spread it on your garden. It's like super food for plants. How many habitats are in the world? How many habitats are there in the world? Let's see. I'm composting this banana peel to make nice, rich soil to grow something new. I found out composters are great habitats for tiny, tiny creatures. But all creatures, whether they're microbe or a whale, need a habitat. And that's a place that has shelter, food, and water. Just like this is my habitat. Check this out. Where creatures living at, some in the water, some in the trees, some in the desert, some in your cheese. Food and water, shelter, space, that's what you need to live in a place. Yeah, food and water, shelter, space, that's what you need to live in a place. Habitat. A creature's living at a 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 habitat. And many other things, a habitat. Some habitats are very small, like the composter just over there. And some are huge, like the ocean that's just at the end of my street. And I got to visit it. Biologist Allison Roberts showed me around. So, Allie, today I'm trying to find the answer to the mind-boggling question, how many habitats are there? But first, what is a habitat? Well, the ha a habitat is basically anything a creature needs to survive. So it's at the shelter, the space, the water. It can be tiny, like you'd need a microscope to see it. Or it can be gigantic, like the, the whole entire planet could be one habitat. Whoa. But you know what, today let's talk about kind of in between. Okay. Let's talk about the intertidal zone. So you need a place that's between the high tide, which would be way up there, and the lowest tide, way down there. How many creatures are living here? Well, there's tons of creatures living here, but they have to be pretty special creatures to survive. Check out all these hermit crabs. Whoa, there's tons. Oh, look at the little small ones. Hermit crabs are pretty weird because they have a really soft shell, and so they have to find another shell to give them a home. Like, this is a snail, yeah. but when that snail dies and yeah. the shell is left on the beach, right. another animal, the hermit, the crab, hermit crab, will move in. In the tide pool, even fish can survive. Oh, weird. But check out what this fish hides in. Whoa, it's the same color as the seaweed. Yeah, look at how many creatures there are in this tiny little space. Yeah. Millions of creatures in the intertidal zone. Look at the shell. I should take it home. Oh, but you have to remember, that shell is somebody's habitat. Right, so I should leave it here. Yeah, pretty much everywhere we go, some creatures, that's their habitat. So we have to respect each other's habitat. And treat it like it's our own. Exactly. Would you want somebody to pick up your house and walk away with it? No. Well, thanks for helping me find stuff out and for showing me all these cool habitats. No problem. Thanks for coming out and hanging out in my office. <laughs> Look, Ali has some friends with very sharp teeth living near her office. Speaking of teeth, I found out there was even science in going to the dentist when I answered Stefano's question. Why do people have to lose teeth? We start out with baby teeth, right? And there are 20 baby teeth in all. Your jaws are kind of small in the beginning, so there's not enough room for more than 20 teeth. Right. But later on, you'll have way more than that. This is an x-ray of a seven-year-old who has half the baby teeth and half the permanent teeth. This is a permanent tooth right here that wants to come up and replace this baby tooth. As it comes up, it eats the roots of the tooth and then comes right to the top. And that's when you lose your tooth, right? That's right. And how old are you when you get your adult teeth? Well, you start to lose your baby teeth at around six, and by the time you're 12 or 13, you have lost them all. That's when you have your, all your adult teeth, right? That's right, and you should have all of yours. And that's why it's very important to keep them nice and clean. Yeah. And you want to keep them forever. For sure. <laughs> Yeah. 
There you go. <laughs> wow, my teeth feel so smooth. Thanks for being on my show and helping me find stuff out. My pleasure. I found out there's science right in our gardens when I investigated the answer to Austin's question. Why do spiders have eight eyes? The better to see you with. If you had eight eyes and eight arms, imagine the wild drum solo you could play. Or maybe not. I found out that spiders don't actually see as well as we do, but having all those extra eyes lets them see in many different directions at once. It also lets them see the things they want to eat and avoid the things that want to eat them. There's science on keeping things on the ground, like my house. And there's even a science that makes things go up, up, and away, as Kevin reminded me. Why does a balloon float? Hmm, interesting question. It took my show to new heights. I went to a balloon festival to find out how they float. And here's balloon expert, Wild Bill. One, two, three, you. Dan, you on the handle? Come on down. You're on this side. Okay. I'm on this side, and we're gonna bring this all the way back to where, where okay. the basket is, all right? Keep going until you run out of balloon. After unfolding the balloon. Here we go. We fill it up with air using this giant fan. Then we turn on the heat with a gas burner. Hot air is lighter than cold air, and that's what makes the balloon rise. We're gonna go in, we're getting in soon. Okay, Harrison, come on board, right in here, man. This is crazy. And we're This is so cool. So how exactly does the heat keep us up? I constantly put heat in because the balloon is always cooling. Right. So if I want to maintain this altitude, I got to put heat in. I'm going to do that right now. So the balloon is now flying in level of flight. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do anything, the balloon will start to cool and we'll start to descend. But if we let the balloon cool too much, then the balloon will come crashing to the ground too fast. <laughs> That's so, not good. So we're going to control the amount of heat we put in right. so we can find a nice soft place up forward here to land. Besides flying high with gas, we can run on liquids, literally. <laughs> oh, yeah, running on a liquid. I'm so cool. OK, hurry, get in. I found out about something called a non-Newtonian fluid. That's a fluid that sometimes acts like a liquid and sometimes acts like a solid. How about just some straight jumping? Just do jump and go. You really have to be fast on your feet not to sink in my water and cornstarch mixture. And switch, green team. Start doing some jumping jacks. <laughs> <laughs> now let's try one foot. Oh, yellow, yellow team is eliminated. Green team won. Yeah. So did you guys think you could jump on a liquid? No. No? Well, I'm going to let LV explain why you could. OK, well, the way it works is we call this cornstarch and water together a non-Newtonian fluid. It gets thicker or thinner if you change the stress, if you hit it. Think of it like you're trying to run into a crowd of people, right? right? If you run really fast, you're just going to bang into them all. But if you go slowly and give them time to get out of your way, you'll be able to go through them. So it's the same thing with this. If you go really fast, you're just going to bounce off it. Well, thank you, Elvie, for helping us find stuff out. You're welcome. You know what else I found out? There's signs in sports. Why does the puck go so fast in hockey after you hit it? This is a matter for the law. Newton's law, that is. Sir Isaac Newton may look like a judge, but he was actually a scientist. About 400 years ago, he figured out three laws that explain how things move. Pucks go fast on ice because they are hard and smooth, just like the ice. 
In professional hockey, they actually freeze the pucks before a game so they're even harder and don't bounce. So when a player takes a slap shot, the puck goes faster. To find out more, here's... My Great Challenge! Today, my great challenges are Mateo and Stefano. Yeah. Awesome. So today we're going to see how fast you guys can shoot a puck. Sound good? Yeah. The radar gun behind the net is going to tell us how fast your shots are, OK? OK. So the first shot we're going to do is the wrist shot while standing still. Mateo, you go first. 66. That's pretty good. OK, Stefano, you're up next. 68. Nice. Looks like Stefano won this one. Yeah. OK, now the last one is the slap shot, but this time you can move with it. 76. Whoa. Whoa, 80. It looks like Stefano's our winner. Yeah. Congratulations. Remember Newton's second law? How fast an object moves depends on how hard it's pushed and how much mass it has. The puck is very light, and it got hit hard. So it went fast. The first one was a wrist shot. Those shots are, usually have less power in it. And the last one, I got to skate up to the puck, so I got to put more speed and power into the shot. So how do you make a really good slap shot? Well, it's good to put your weight into the puck and all the weight on the front foot right. and follow through at the end of the shot. Well, what I do is I transfer all my weight from my upper body down onto my leg, mm -hmm. and I take my shot and I follow through, pointing with my, the end of my blade where I want the puck to go. Awesome. Check this out. This was my hockey stick when I was only four years old. Of course, it's way too small for me now, but that's because when I used this thing, I was only this high. There's even a science in how we grow and develop over time, as I found out when I answered Priscilla's question. Why do seniors get wrinkles? To answer your question, Priscilla, I decided to go to a place that can make me grow up really fast. And here to turn me into a senior citizen is Stan Edmonds, head of makeup design for film and television here at Vancouver Film School. Hey. Welcome, Harrison. So why do people get wrinkles? Well, there's a lot to talk about regarding that. And why don't you sit down? we got a few hours to go over it. Sure. A few days ago, I went to the film school. And they put goop all over my head and hands, which hardened into a cast. Then they poured rubbery stuff inside the cast to make fake skin that fit my face and hands perfectly. Stan tells me that aging has a lot to do with gravity. Well, as people age, sometimes you gain a little bit of weight as you get older. And so the weight of the sides of your face and your neck will start to droop just with the force of gravity. So if I lived my life upside down like a bat, then I wouldn't get wrinkles, right? <laughs> Can you imagine living upside down? You'd have a head full of, like, of dizziness. As you grow older, your skin loses its elasticity and has less spring to snap back into place so wrinkles can form. Ultraviolet rays from the sun also give you wrinkles. Kids don't get wrinkles for a while because they haven't been in the sun, they're young, their faces haven't moved and aged and weathered. So what can I do to prevent getting wrinkles and deteriorating? What you can do is drink lots of water. That's the number one health and beauty secret. Oh. Use moisturizer and use sunscreen when you're in the sun. And now, for the crowning touch, boys and girls, the senior version of me. It's time for the big reveal. <laughs> I'm bald and bald. I, I look kind of like my grandpa. You look like my grandfather. Really? I am your grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> of course, before you can get old, you have to be a baby first. And there's even a science involved in babies and little brothers and sisters. I know you only copy me because you want to be just like me. Gross! I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? <laughs> Have you ever heard the expression, monkey see, monkey do? Well, monkeys learn by imitating others.
us humans can't help wanting to copy. It's in our nature. It's how your parents learn to do stuff, and your grandparents, and your great-grandparents. We're naturally copycats. I know you are, but what I am I? I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? I know you are, but what am I? But what am I? I know you are, 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 but what am I? I've learned a lot by watching, and copying too, and by finding out the answers to your questions, which gave me an idea. I think that answering your questions should be my science project. I just hope my teacher thinks so too. So keep sending them in. Now presenting my sister's favorite stuff from the show. Ah. Hi, welcome to Finding Stuff Out. Today's show might be a little weird. My sister got into my computer and she had a bunch of her own ideas about how to do today's show. She put together a bunch of her favorite clips. And she decorated them. She says she likes science because it's weird and surprising. I don't think it's weird, do you? Ew. Disgusting, maybe, but not weird. People did used to believe a lot of weird things, though. There's a big bump. 200 years ago, scientists thought certain areas of the brain made people criminals. And by measuring bumps and dips on people's heads, they could tell if someone had a criminal brain. Aha! Obviously guilty. Another thing they believed was that black cats were witches. Black cats aren't really black cats. They're witches who turn themselves into cats. That's right, witch. I know you're in there. And some even thought mermaids existed. Ah! I saw a mermaid on me last voyage. She had silky brown hair and a tail like a fish. She looked just like this. Oh, a girl like a fish is every sailor's wish. A girl with a tail who can swim like a whale. Those guys were wrong, but my sister may have a point. Some things in nature really are weird, like this. What do reptiles eat? Reptiles can eat bugs, fish, and small animals. Oh, and snakes can eat big animals like deer. Wait, what? How is it possible? A deer is this big, and a snake's mouth is only that big. <sighs> How can a snake even do it? How does his mouth not rip open, or his head not explode? Uh-oh, my head's starting to overload! Ah! You're gonna make my head explode! Oh. I think my head would explode if I tried to eat something that big. Well, actually, when snakes eat, they dislocate the back of their jaws like this so that they can swallow things larger than their heads. Yeah, that is weird. If you were a snake, you could eat a whole watermelon in one bite. You know what else is kind of weird? How astronauts float around in space. I mean, imagine being in space where you can't walk or run. Here's a question about that. How do astronauts train for zero gravity? To find out, I got advice from a real astronaut in training, Jeremy Hansen. Jeremy trains in a swimming pool, but he also trains way up in the sky. Oh, we have this really cool airplane, and you get in this airplane and it flies up into the sky, and then you're just sitting on the floor, and it does this roller coaster motion, goes down like this, and while it's diving down, you're in zero gravity. You're floating just like you're in space, and it is a ton of fun. You can fly all over the airplane, you can do flips, uh, you can tackle your buddies. It's just a really great time, but most importantly, you get to experience what it's going to be like when you're in space. I challenge kids to take a spacewalk of their own. This special swing makes our challengers float around, sort of like in zero gravity. Their job is to screw energy cells onto a satellite. Yes. Oh, there, he almost has it. He just has to get it in. Oh, she almost missed it, though. Oh, she has Wow, she's going really fast. And does she have number two? Yes. Yeah, she has it. I even got some training myself on a simulator at the Canadian Space Agency. 
I have to move the Canada arm so that the end locks onto the pin on the shuttle. Then the arm can dock to the space station. Wow, I think I'm gonna be good at this because of the years of experience of video games I have. Well, let's see. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Wow. Are astronauts normally good at this? Well, some of them are. Uh, the ones that used to be fighter pilots tend to be really good. But then there are some that are doctors and scientists and really never had time to play video games. So you might actually be better than them. Whoa. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Came close. Whoa, OK. I'm almost there. You're doing really well. You're getting closer. Whoa. Standing by for grapple confirmation. Robotic arm finishing closing in. Now. Did it work? Did I get, yeah. Uh, Dragon confirmed in place and docked to the International Space Station at the Harmony Node. This is awesome. It was fun training like an astronaut, even if being in space would feel weird. But sometimes science isn't weird, but the way you test it is. Why do we need sunscreen? The experiment! To find out why we need to use sunscreen, I've come to the sunniest place I know, the beach. Harrison, I've got something really neat to help us with our experiment. A pizza, all right. Can you answer that question with pizza? No, but you can with Frisbees. Yeah, these are really cool Frisbees. They're designed to change color from white to purple when they get exposed to the UV rays from the sun. So very similar to the Frisbee, when we're outside, mm -hmm. our skin contains cells called melanocytes, and they release little pockets of pigment that are designed to protect the rest of our skin. Very similar to opening an umbrella. Whoa. Hi there, melanocytes. Uh-oh, here comes the sun. Quick. We need protection! Open your pigment umbrellas! <laughs> the pigment umbrellas do protect us for a little while. Hmm. But if we stay out in the sun too long, they can't keep up, and we get sunburns. Oh. Oh, but it didn't change color when it hit the sun this time. Now, these are exactly the same Frisbees, but earlier at the hospital, I covered this one with an SPF of sunscreen of 45. Right, so that's why it didn't change color. It's because it has the sunblock on it, right? That's correct. Except for, like, the few spots that you missed. <laughs> I did miss a few spots. When we put our sunscreen on, we have to cover all of the areas. Otherwise, you'll get a burn in those spots. Right. So I think we're ready to go. Nice. Let's play some Frisbee. All right. <laughs> Oh, I feel so safe at the beach since you put sunblock on me. I didn't put sunblock on you. Uh, if you didn't, who did? <laughs> Save me! I can't. He's too scaly. <laughs> that was definitely a weird experiment. Here's another one. I'm going to see if I can grow my own rocks the same way they grow in a cave. I have two jars of water here in which I am dissolving Epsom salts. Then I'm taking this string with two weights attached to each end so that it'll sink to the bottom of each jar. Then I'm gonna slide this plate underneath and wait. As you can see, a week later, I've grown some stalactites and the start of some stalagmites. Pretty cool. I'm glad my sister liked it too. But this experiment was my favorite. How to break a karate board with just your hand. <laughs> Can you do more? Whoa. Three boards, please. Three boards. <sighs> it's sort of amazing how you can break boards with your hand, but there's a scientific explanation. 
The pine wood that Henry broke has seams, sort of like the paper towels Elvie showed me. Those are its weak spots. Our hand bones are stronger, and the flesh around them cushions the blow. Sort of like the way marshmallows and sponges protected our challenger's eggs. So, when a karate master hits the wood's weak spot with just the right speed and power, the wood breaks. But it takes a lot of training. I think I'm ready. Good. I can break a plank, right? Yeah. Bring the special plank with. Oh, a baguette. Okay. Nice. Thanks for helping me find stuff out. I know it was only a baguette that I broke, but you have to start somewhere. Hiya! My sister likes this next clip even better because I had to do something kind of gross. What's that right there? Oh, that's a huge poop. It has to be something big, like maybe a bear. You got it. That's a bear poop. It's not even a big bear poop. They can be huge. Well, I guess I should put my mask on. Go for it, Harrison. Let's Pick it up. This nice poop. Uh, which piece should I grab? Oh, get as much as you can. Oh, it's all warm. <laughs> oh, this is so gross. <laughs> oh, perfect. Got I'll it. take that from you. Yeah, you can take care of that. Can't wait to see what this guy's been eating. Put it in there. Keep it safe. It's safe. <laughs> We'll find one more, huh? One more. Let's go find right. some poop. Let's go looking. Right there, more poop. Oh, look at that one. That's <laughs> a beauty. You can pick it up this time. You're the pro. OK, that's a coyote poop. I'm sure of it. But we'll go take it back to the lab, have a closer look. Awesome. Uh, away we go. Let's go. So let's start with the coyote. It's kind of the biggest bones and obvious here. Anytime you look at a bone like that, it's pretty hard to tell where that's from, what kind of animal. But yeah. the best thing is if you can happen to find some teeth. Oh, okay. there's a couple right there. Look at those teeth right there, huh? So we'll be able to tell what he's eating. Yeah, the teeth are a lot more characteristic of which mammal it's from. I think that must be from a squirrel. So now we know the coyote's been eating squirrels. You've got it. So I guess analyzing poop like this is pretty important. It really is. It tells you a lot about an animal. It tells you what they eat, their health, are they in good condition or bad. It can even tell you whether they're endangered or not. So you really learn a lot. Wow. Well, thanks so much for helping me find stuff out. It's great. It's a pleasure to meet you, Harrison. I put challengers to the same test. My great challenge! Today, your challenge is to figure out what kind of animals that <laughs> this poop belongs to. It's either going to be a herbivore, an animal that eats plants, a carnivore, an animal that eats meat, or an omnivore, that's an animal that eats both. Oh, but it's not real poop, it's my poop. <laughs> I, I mean, poop that I made. To make my fake poop, I mix some water, brown food coloring, vegetable oil, salt, and flour. Just stir the whole thing and squish it with your hands until it looks like really nice poop. Ew! Oh, well. Oh, well. Let's go, Joe. Oh, oh, I see something. I see something. Oh, it's a bone. What about this type of poop? Hey, this one looks like whiskers. Must have ate a bunny or a cat. Uh, carnivore. That's right. That fake poop is supposed to be wolf poop. What? And wolves are carnivores. Go. Oh, this one. Oh, this is disgusting. <laughs> Ew. 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 Are those fish bones? Ew. Oh. Look. Oh. A cranberry or something? It's a fruit. Omnivore? That's right. It's fake bear poop. Bears eat lots of different kinds of food, including berries and fish, so I put that in my fake bear poop. Ready? Go! Oh. Uh -huh. I got something, I got something. Enjoy, we're, we're going on something. Oh, piece of grass. Herbivore. That's also right. Oh, wow. Number three. <laughs> oh, Joey! <laughs> this fake poop is supposed to look like horse poop. It really oh. does. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. What is this? <gasps> is that a bug? <laughs> I see nuts. An omnivore? Yes, it's an omnivore. And it's fake raccoon poop. <gasps> oh, OK, that's disgusting. <laughs> Raccoons eat all kinds of weird things, including what is in our garbage cans. In this fake poop, there's a mix of seeds, nuts, and crickets. OK, so the winner is 
Team one. Yeah! And team two. Yeah! It's a tie. Oh, wow. And here's another surprisingly stinky question. Do fire-powered engines exist? Well, Luca, I couldn't find an engine that runs specifically on, you know. First of all, I'm not sure how exactly you'd get them into the engine. Fill her up! But actually, your question isn't as silly as it sounds. I found out that farts have two gases in them, hydrogen and methane. And just like gasoline, those gases can be set on fire inside an engine to make an explosion to power a car. And guess what? There really are engines that run on both of those gases. This is a Volkswagen Beetle that runs on human poop that's been converted to methane gas and stored in these tanks. Just like the methane gas in. And this car runs on hydrogen. Also a gas that's found in. So, Luca, you could say yes, fart-powered engines do exist. I guess my sister has a point about science being weird. Why don't people have wild animals as their pets? Well, Stuart here, my American alligator, actually used to be somebody's pet. Uh, and he was a baby alligator that got too big. Its owner must have been some evil villain who wanted to guard his lair. Who was he? As a matter of fact, he was a teenager. Yikes! Did Stuart eat him? No, Stuart started like one of our little alligators. Aw, look at the little guy. A year and a half later, he just got too big for the teenager and was given to us at the zoo. Does it happen often that people have to get rid of wild pets? Uh, it happens a fair bit, but unfortunately, there's not a lot of facilities like this, and many animals like Stuart end up being released on the side of the road, in parks, and even in ecosystems where they're not supposed to be. What happens to them? Sadly, a lot of them end up passing away and not surviving, but in, in some cases, they actually end up in ecosystems where they don't belong, and they do survive, and they start to breed. Uh, either case is, is terrible for the ecosystem and for the animals that are there. Thanks for your help, Little Ray. Hey, thanks, Harrison. Have a great day. Goodbye, Stuart. Please don't eat Little Ray. Can you imagine having a big, scary reptile like that in your house, creeping up on you? <laughs> Did I fool you? Well. Reptiles aren't scary, fire-breathing monsters at all. <laughs> I thought you were a nice reptile. <laughs> Just kidding. But speaking of things that creep up on you... Can robots be dangerous and attack us? <laughs> Destroy mankind. Destroy mankind. Apparently, yes, but only in movies. I met all kinds of surprising robots on my show, and some thought they were smarter than me. Ask me any question. Hmm. Who invented the first robot? Leonardo da Vinci invented the first humanoid robot 518 years ago. Well, what about this? What's 2 trillion, 48 billion, divided by 512 billion? The answer is 4. How can he know all this stuff? You know what else is helpful, but also sort of weird? The way detectives can tell who you are by tiny things like your fingerprints or by your spit. <laughs> How do investigators detect DNA? I found out that DNA is sort of like the recipe of who we are. It's everywhere in our bodies, and every person's DNA is different. So when detectives find a piece of hair or skin or even saliva at the scene of a crime, they can often find out who it belongs to, and that helps them catch the bad guys. In the case of your sandwich, you're gonna try to uh, pick up spit on the bite mark. Right, and why are we wearing these gloves and masks? Well, we want to make sure we don't contaminate the sandwich with our own DNA. Well, then let's find some DNA on this sandwich. Okay, so what I want oh. you to do is just take the swab, hold the plastic part here. Okay. Just take a swab of Around the bite mark. Bite. Yeah. So, just take so that. we're going to try to pick up spit like that. Close the tip. Just like okay. that. Down. Put it in this yeah. bag. Cool. And first. Now we'll send it off. Send it off to the crime lab. Nice. 
here's something I didn't believe at first. I thought people were making it up, but it's true. Why do geckos lose their tails? Geckos can lose their tails, but it's not because they forget where they put it. A gecko has a long, easy to catch tail. But if a predator chomps it, the gecko can just drop his tail and run away. Run, save yourself. But I can't just leave you here. Don't worry about me. The tail still wiggles for a while on its own. So the predator doesn't realize the gecko escaped. It's really stressful for a gecko to lose its tail and it gets bullied by other geckos. So never pick up a gecko by its tail because it could get scared and the tail could fall off. Yeah, you want to keep your tail, don't you? Oh. Well, I guess my sister was right. Science is weird and surprising, but that's what makes it fun. I like the clip she picked for today's show, but normally I try really hard to be serious and at least more serious than that. And so do all my scientific guests. See you next time for more Finding Stuff Out.